Welcome everyone um, to our next installment of Uses of Affliction, our Monday Night Writer Speak at Manhattan. Uh, first, we'd like to especially welcome uh, Carla Cagliotti and Len Walker. What did I say? Who? Cagliotti. Uh, and Luann Walker, who came in from Southampton for tonight. <laughs> so, um, just a couple announcements before we get rolling. Uh, this time next year, there's going to be a submission period open for uh, the Southampton Review that's going to be an issue dedicated to the theme of narrative medicine. So, uh, for those of you working on this in class or for other people who are interested in the subject, keep your eye out for the submission window next year. Um, as some news about our classes in the spring in Manhattan here, uh, just a heads up that Roger's memoir class on Saturdays is almost full, and the same goes for Susan Minot's short fiction. Um, there's still some room in Patty Marks' humor class, so if you haven't already picked out your classes, now's the time. Um, this series that we have, Uses of Affliction, is uh, Reading and Writing Illness. The series is an open classroom format following the curriculum of the course of the same name, Uses of Affliction, Reading and Writing Illness, co-taught by Dan Manneker and Magdalene Brandeis. All guests and discussions are linked around a common theme, illness and fiction, illness and nonfiction, illness in the culture, and the new emerging theme of narrative medicine. So without further ado, Joanne Rocha is gonna come up and introduce tonight's guest. Mm. There is only one way to introduce a book as heartfelt as Rita Charon's Narrative Medicine. That is with a heartfelt introduction. Therefore, I must make it personal. Rita Charon, I want you to be my doctor. <laughs> How revolutionary is this? A doctor who listens and hears her patient's stories. When was the last time you met one? <laughs> the voice I hear when I listen to Rita Charon is full of wisdom, kindness, hope. I also hear frustration, sadness, loneliness. When she writes about close reading in part three, developing narrative competence, I immediately associate it with a poem written by Wallace Stevens called, The House Was Quiet and the World Was Calm. The house was quiet and the world was calm. The reader became the book and summer night was like the conscious being of the book. The house was quiet and the world was calm. The words were spoken as if there was no book, except that the reader leaned above the page, wanted to lean, wanted much to be the scholar to whom his book is true, to whom the summer night is like a perfection of thought. The house was quiet because it had to be. The quiet was part of the meaning, part of the mind, the access of perfection to the page. And the world was calm, the truth in a calm world in which is, there is no other meaning, itself is calm, itself is summer and night, itself is the reader leaning late and reading there. The poet's voice reminds me that I will become one with a book if I read it closely, the way Dr. Charon reads her patients. Face to face, not side by side in some parallel play. No, face to face, as she says, leaning forward toward the person who suffers. It's summer, the poet tells us. This is a young voice. While the voice in her book is experience, it is also young because of the passion and optimism she shows. The calm I experience after reading her book comes from the hope I feel for doctors and their patients. Those in narrative medicine are pioneers leading us to a better future. Finally, she ends her book with the word joy. 
How fitting for this humble woman. She is grateful for her calling to be able to suffer with those who are ill. It's what St. Paul talks about in Ephesians, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened. Rita Charon is a general internist and narratologist at Columbia University who originated the field of narrative medicine. She is founder and executive director of the program in narrative medicine at Columbia. She completed the MD at Harvard in 1978 and the PhD in English at Columbia in 1999, concentrating on the works of Henry James. Her research focuses on the consequences of narrative medicine practice, reflective clinical practice, and healthcare team effectiveness. At Columbia, she is professor of clinical medicine, director of the narrative and social medicine scholarly concentration track, director of faculty development for the division of general medicine, and the director of Columbia Macy Interprofessional Education Project. She has served as visiting professor at many medical schools and universities in the United States and abroad, teaching narrative medicine theory and practice. She has received a Rockefeller Foundation Bellagio residency, a Guggenheim Fellowship, and research funding from the NIH, the NEH, the VA, and several private foundations. She served as co-editor-in-chief of literature and medicine from 2000 to 2007. She lectures widely on narrative medicine and has published in such journals of medicine and literary studies as the New England Journal of Medicine, Lancet, JAMA, Annals of Internal Medicine, Narrative, Henry James Review, and Literature and Medicine. She is the author of Narrative Medicine, Honoring the Stories of Illness, and co-editor of Stories Matter, The Role of Narrative in Medical Ethics, and Psychoanalysis, Psychoanalysis and Narrative Medicine. It is with joy that we welcome Rita Chair. So this, this is much more fun than what I usually do, which is talking with doctors, nurses, physical therapists, uh, people in the body half of what we're doing, um, who often almost take affront that I bring them news of stories and poems and suggest to them that they themselves know how to write and can write for discovery. That writing is not just reporting or recording, but that if they give them, if they let themselves, um, they will make access with that which they know but is out of awareness, simply through the writing. But, but so here, you see, it's the other way around. And I hope by the end of whatever time we have, that, that you will see what riches you have to bring to the doctors, nurses, social workers, and students of all of those domains, all right? Um, um, my study of, of literature and writing came way after the, the medical part because it was sitting in those little rooms like just like really being baffled by the, not just the situations and the accounts, but the multiple contradictory versions of the situations and the accounts to which I was subjected. So that the patient would say one thing, her, her adult daughter would say something else, the neighbor would say something else, the intern down in the emergency room would have a whole different thing. And, and I came to understand that that was simply my job, to cohere these many conflicting versions or construals of a set of events or situations or, or uh, states of affairs. 
So that's what sent me to the English department to say, in effect, can you teach a doctor something about how stories work? And, and they did. I really think they did. And I love when I see somebody referring to something that I wrote, and they call me a narratologist. Mm. I love that. <laughs> better yet, they call me a Jamesian. That's even better. <laughs> but, but, and that's not to turn my back on the internal medicine. I do it. That's what I do. That's what pays my rent. Um, and yet, that which you all know because you are writers is what we so sorely and dangerously lack. Now, since, since this book, and I really had to take mine off the shelf and look at it uh, to remember kind of what was in it, um, um, since then, we have started a master's program in narrative medicine at Columbia. Uh, and we, we have moved along in some of the thinking. So, so as, I looked, as I looked at this, at this book just, just today, um, it was not at all nostalgic. Instead, it was kind of, well, now I think we know something about how to answer that particular question. Or we don't believe that anymore at all. Do you see? I mean, it's very, it, you, you do this, right? You read something you wrote five years ago. It's spooky, mm -hmm. right? It's very spooky. I, I do want to read you some of it, though. I want to read you a few paragraphs of because, well, you'll see why because. So I'm going to read you a very short um, description of um, a patient. An 85-year-old woman with bad asthma comes in to see me. I'd known her for almost 20 years. We have managed to decrease her hospitalizations and emergency room visits dramatically over the years. So she is grateful and I am proud. Today, she sits and weeps. I know that her 28-year-old grandson just last week drowned in the ocean off Miami. I know that her son, this dead man's father, was shot to death on the streets of Harlem at age 36. She sits next to me and she weeps. Her English and my Spanish enable us to reach one another. Her pain is unbearable. Suffering again the loss of her son by virtue of the loss of her grandson, she is overwhelmed by her grief. Yes, she prays to a God she still feels near. Yes, she is comforted by the presence of her daughter. Yes, she allows herself to talk about her two lost men. She knows that time will heal her pain, and she knows to wait. I weep with her, unable to fathom her agony, but able to honor her bereft state. I listen as she tells of her anguish, knowing that her telling of it is therapeutic. I will see her next week and the next week after that, not to fix anything, but simply to watch with her, to listen to her, to behold in awe her faith and power and love. So that was maybe in 2002 that, that, that the, 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 the boy died uh, a drowning. And, uh, and I just want to tell you how it's been since then. Um, she has died by now. Uh, she, she was 85. She died almost 100. She almost made 100. She developed rectal cancer after this. She needed an operation. She did well despite her um, lung disease. Um, and then just last year, uh, she was hospitalized with really end-stage respiratory um, um, failure. It's as if the asthma kind of caught up. So she was in the hospital. She had developed pneumonia. Um,
And everyone knew, I was trying to remember, I couldn't even remember who kindly, who decided, but it was known that we shouldn't have her go into the intensive care unit and go on a ventilator. So, so she was in the hospital, this was not that long ago, um, for what I knew was her final hospitalization. And um, we were treating the pneumonia, but we were also treating her, her, um, um, her suffering, her, 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 her breathing distress. The only thing that I added to what the very competent uh, resident and uh, hospital doctors had done was to ask her to call the chaplain because I knew that, that this was a Catholic family. And I happened to be in the room when the chaplain came. Um, and he came to get, if, if there are uh, those among you who, who grew up Catholic, you know that at the time of death, the extreme unction is given, uh, which is an anointing with sacred oil of the, of the uh, person dying. So the, the priest came in and he had a, um, you know, a, a beautiful stole of many colors and a small um, um, metal, golden, um, tiny reservoir of the sacred oil. And from it, he um, made crosses on her forehead, her eyes, her lips, her hands, and her feet. And all of us were sitting, standing around the, um, the bed. And, uh, and then the priest in um, Latin said the final confessional prayer, which I know in English means that he was forgiving her her sins. And I was able to say to her son, uh, the, the living son that I know pretty well, um, that it was unnecessary because she had none. And she died a few days later. I went to the funeral, which was in um, Washington Heights. It was a Spanish family. And uh, this was now years after what was in this book. And at the funeral, uh, I knew the son pretty well. But I met all her other relatives, including the ones from Miami. And this tall, beautiful man, I think he said he was 37 years old. I think that's what he said, although it doesn't jive with the ages in this book. He was a tall, beautiful, um, over 30 year old. And he had um, um, some children with him. And he says, I remember Dr. Sharon, I remember I would take my grandmother to your office when I was 12. There you go. Now, the, what I did for the family is wrote a description. I wrote just what I just told you, up until the when I was 12, and sent it to her son, who sent it to the others in the family. And this counted as a kind of, I don't quite know what to call it, a reverence. Hmm? Um, so that's what these kinds of practices lead us to be able to do. Uh, it is not unusual for a doctor to go to funerals. We all do it quite a bit, uh, more for our sake perhaps than for families. Um, but the giving of the remembrance and the, um, the plotting, the plotting of events, not just of illness now, but of just ordinary living, when seen from this strange uh, uh, position of doctor, um, has meaning. So more and more we're um, um, engaging patients, families uh, to write with us. And that's what I wanted tell you that you're needed for, do you see? Um, that not only is narrative medicine a good way to bring learning from the, the disciplines of literature and philosophy and, and, and visual art and music, um, our work lately has gone actually quite beyond narrative in text, um, but, but much more fundamental than that. 
that the act, as you know better than I, the act of writing enable you to see. That's it. Um, you know, Cezanne, <laughs> Cezanne says as he's, as he's painting one in the interminable series of Mont Saint Victoire paintings, he says in a letter to Emile Bernard, one should penetrate what one has in front of one. See? One should penetrate what one has in front of one. And that's kind of what we try to do is to, and the parts of this book that I still rather enjoy looking at are the parts about attention and the ways in which one makes oneself available to those, to, to him or her, I'm gonna get the sentence all wrong, let me start over. The, the attention is that which allows the beholding, is that which allows for a doctor or a nurse or a physical therapist to sit in a room with someone who's come for care and, and see them. I mean, very simply, see them and not just see what medical problem they're causing. I mean, it feels like they're causing, you're causing me a problem by coming with your chest pain. <laughs> <laughs> Do you see? So, so, so that's, I, I'm trying to impress on you the magnitude of the difference. That really quite f simple, ordinary skills in seeing, in hearing, in writing can make in the office. Um, how do we, how do we teach people to see? Here's one of what I count as a discovery. It's not a discovery, but nobody in medicine knew about it. That we teach people to see by teaching them to represent. And again, this you know. It was Nelson Goodman in Languages of Art who talks about um, what we see when we look at something what we see when we look at an object. And he asks, what is it that we see when we look at an object? Well, the first part is easy. He reminded us all that what we see when we look at an object is a version or construal of that object. Fair enough, it depends on where you're sitting. But then he goes on to say, when we represent the version or construal of the object, we do not copy it we achieve it, right? So, so that's what we're trying for in, in, in the work, um, whether the writing is done by the healthcare professional, by the student, or by the patient, or by both. So I'm gonna read you an, another one where, where the patient and I kind of wrote together, and then I'm gonna tell you my latest, what happened just last Thursday and then we'll, we'll have some conversation. Um, so this is just recent. I wrote about a patient recently in order to figure out what had happened. She had had breast cancer around 10 years ago, had a lumpectomy with tamoxifen afterwards. After five years of this, she was told she was cured. Then she developed a mass in the other breast. This was about six months ago. She treated this recurrence very matter-of-factly, submitting to a mastectomy, declining breast reconstruction, saying she was too old to need that. She recovered from the disfiguring surgery quickly, non-complainingly. Then she began to worry that the cancer would come back again. She felt new lumps in the mastectomy scar. She thought she felt gross in the soft tissue under her arm. She was terrified that it would come back. She visited either the breast surgeon or me every other week. We did ultrasounds, we tested her blood for cancer markers. We both kept telling her that she was fine, that after an operation, there's always some shifting of the sh tissues as the injury heals, that her cancer markers were not elevated. She could not feel reassured 
and so she felt we were deceiving her. But then, after another negative breast exam, I recognized what I thought might have felt deep to the scar for her. I thought she might be in the glare of the knowledge that she will die. I leaned back against the sink next to the examining table. I told her I could not reassure her that her body did not harbor the disease that would take her life. It might or might not be the breast cancer, but it will be something. I told her she had gained sight from her last illness and that I thought she was now able to see what the rest of us hide from, that knowledge that we too will die. I offered to do something with her. I offered to stand with her as she gazed into that glare to minimize its terrible isolation. So here's what I wrote in the medical chart that day. We have electronic charts. We have to upload things into the computer. So this was my, as we call them, progress note for the day. The patient continues with persistent concern about breast cancer recurrence. No wonder. She had what was assumed to be full and curative treatment of the first episode of breast cancer. And then alarmingly, it suddenly recurred. Since her mastectomy, she continues hypervigilant, not altogether consoled by the negative CA2729 levels or the systematic examination by ultrasound and physical examination of the scar. She feels and sees that the scar changes and this she takes as evidence that either the cancer was not eradicated or that a third one is underway. I understand this. I can imagine what her feelings might be in the face of a second cancer. Because she's a complex, very intelligent, very insightful woman, she has to suffer the burden of this experienced and conscious uncertainty. It is an uncertainty that all mortals live with, but that in ordinary circumstances, most of us can ignore. This is not the case with Mrs. C. She has to suffer the daily reminders that her body is not like it was before this last insult and that there may be future insults to come.
conversation. And the things that had not come up in our conversation is where she find, where she herself feels pleasure and achievement and reward and how her students look up to her and her colleagues are thrilled with the work she's doing in the department. So it was some way in which through her writing she was able to gain access to some, some parts of what she was undergoing that were strengthening for her. So I'm now figuring out how to make that legit by, by the hospital. Uh, but I think that kind of belongs. Now, I want to stop and see what part of all this we should talk about. Should we, um, the, the format of this is that you and I will sit in the chairs now. Oh, okay. I have a bunch of questions. And um, in the absence of Dan, I'm filling in as the yes. chairs. And I'm representing a bunch of our clients. One of the things that we um, were really struck with was the notion of dual narratives, mm -hmm. that we have the story of the life and then the story of the body, and that the doctor's job is to sort of find the place where they meet. And I'm, I mean, for us, it's a very um, exciting way to look at fiction as well. Mm -hmm. So I'm just curious about if you could speak more to the people who haven't read your book as closely mm -hmm. as we have. The, the, the tension inside the health side is obviously that the only thing that matters is the body, and not the lived body, not the Merleau-Ponty body. The, the body is object. And, and, and indeed, it's very, there's a lot to do. You know, somebody comes in, and however much I intend to be, you know, available and present and noticing, um, my mind is whirring with all the things that, that uh, not just like is it time for the mammogram and did you have her flu shot, but all the more sinister things. You know, I know there's colon cancer in the family and what's going to, why did she lose weight? So, so you can't just abandon yourself mm -hmm. to being in the uh, uh, narrative world. And yet, the only way to do justice to even the body ailments is to be in the narrative world. So that these are very, these are high paradox. They're high paradox. So when, when we bring um, narrative skills, narrative training to the, the, clini the clinicians, whether they're students or, or trainees or, or um, uh, you know, professionals, um, we, Oh, how can I say, we almost have to trick them mm -hmm. into, for a moment, not paying attention to the body. So we're not going to do the writing. I, I didn't realize you all were MFA already, so you don't need me to coach you in the writing. But what I will do is give you a copy of what I was going to have you write to. Because this, this is an example of a way that we might try to do that. It's just a little paragraph out of Colin McCann's Let the Great World Spin. And it has nothing to do with medicine and nothing to do with anything medical. And we just kind of entice the readers in to see the text and what's going on in the text. And, um, and then at the end of it, we give them a prompt that again has nothing to do with clinical anything, but is just a, you know what a good writing prompt is. It's just kind of a slanted, a slanted invitation to write in the shadow of what's just been written, uh, what's just been read. So, so, but that's the, the lengths to which we have to go mm -hmm. to uh, 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 circumvent the body sitting in the room. So, um, I found the parallel charts very, very interesting. So um, I'll, I'll do my synopsis and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So the interns and the young residents go through and they meet with patients and they've done their, their technical medical chart and then the exercise is to just write about what else in the experience struck them 
and they come out as little stories, and they have narrative point of views, and they have plot, and they have development, and they have desire, and they have all the elements. Then what I find, and if I have left anything out, correct me on that, but what I found interesting is, rather than talking about these narratives medically and saying, you know, could it have been recurring breast cancer or something like that, you, you talk about it in literary yeah. terms. So can you explain yes. how that works? And, um, okay, so it, it's taken um, many medical schools, nursing schools, physical therapy schools, do what they call reflective writing with their students. And it's typically a prompt like, write about the last time you made a bad mistake or write about the first time a patient on your service died, or write about um, uh, a patient who reminds you of someone in your family. These are, um, they're, they're, they're almost more like essay questions than prompts. And typically, the students will write something, I mean, they have to, it's required. And then even just today, I got into almost a fight on a conference call because somebody from a Texan medical school was describing their reflective writing, and I kind of barged in and said, who reads them? And she says, the course director. And I say, how many students? And she said, 90. So I said, then the reader doesn't meet with the writer. The reader doesn't say anything to the writer about what has been written. And she got very grumpy and kind of tetchy. Well, we don't have the resources like you do at Columbia. She got very tetchy. So, but that's, the, that's usually how it goes, that the reflective writing is supposed to be sufficient unto itself, and that once it's done, his job is done. And all you have to do is check the box that the student did it. And there are some schools where nobody reads it. They just check the box. Well, they did it. It was an assignment. Mm -hmm. So we've, because I was, because I have, I'm the only medical school who has a creative director. There's a creative director of our medical school, it's novelist Nellie Herman, um, who has with me developed. This is of the narrative medicine school or of the? No, of the medical school. Well, no, I mean, she's the creative director of the program in narrative medicine, mm -hmm. but there's no such. Position. She loves it. Quick, where's my card? <laughs> Creative director. So, so what we do, um, you know, systematically, methodically with, with uh, faculty is teach them how to read in real reading. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, uh, what are the sensory details? What do you observe? What do you, what do you see? What do you hear? What do you smell? What do you taste? What's the temporal uh, uh, the scaffolding? What, because, and that's not unlike what we did here, because that's the service you do to the, to the writer. You don't, you don't need me to tell the writer maybe it was asthma. That's not useful. Nor do you need the reader to tell them maybe the attending shouldn't have done that. Or even, I'm sorry that happened to you. That's not what the writing class is for. Instead, it's so that the writer understands what he or she did. So a question like, you know, how come at the beginning you're, you're I and then you become she? How did that happen? Or how come here the patient is speaking and by just looking at the actual structure of, of the story, will allow a student to see what indeed he or she has gone through, rather than fussing with the medical facts or the even actions. Mm -hmm. So what, this is what I was wondering as I was reading, is I think with writing students, when you start to say, you know, the difference between omniscient and third person close, you, people become self-conscious as writers and it sometimes can reflect, uh, restrict them creatively. So I'm just curious, how does an awareness of net narrative structure help a doctor? Because they have no idea that they're doing anything. So we point out, look, you're doing something. Look, you're using a breezy casual diction to talk about this thing that happened in the intensive care unit. 
how does that work? Mm -hmm. Or even, who do you think you're talking to? Who's talking? Who's the speaker? Who's giving me this story? I mean, really, that's what I mean by you have so much to teach them. Really, really elemental, basic things about what happens when one person tells another person that something happened. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's a gift to the writer to let that writer know what he or she has made visible. And it's typically made visible not in the plot, but in the form. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's so elemental. You guys did this when you were in high school because you were writers. But, but my students did not, on the whole. And it floors them. I, I work with the faculty. It floors them. The only, the, 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 how can I say, the punishment is now they keep asking us, okay, will you come in for our 8 o'clock conference? Because we want to do more writing, right? <laughs> so we have to schlep in at 8 o'clock because we, can, we, we don't say no. Right. The pediatricians, the emergency room doctors, the hospitalists, the uh, uh, social workers, the child psychiatrists, they, they, want, to, they want to write. Do they always write about what's happened in their practice, no. or do they write fiction? No. And Usually, we, we bring we bring a, a, a paragraph of, of, of a, a story or a fiction, or we bring a poem. We spend a good 20 minutes talking about how the text works. I mean, in ways that it would sound like, you know, a seminar in the English department. Mm -hmm. and, and they're getting, some of them are, are pretty good, so they understand what the narrative structure and what diction is and what's illusion and what's, what's um, and only after such a conversation will we then give them a prompt that has some relation to what we've just read. Mm -hmm. And then they write. So um, one of the questions that we had in this book, there's a very carefully constructed argument leading up until the point where a case for doing this has been made. And then it sort of, the structure of it relaxes in a way. And um, I come from alternative healing. There's a bunch of us who have all these theories that, you know, shamanism was brought up. There's all kinds of things that we were talking about in the context of what the book is actually about. Um, you, you evoke the storyteller and people's relationship with God. I mean, a lot of it is like alternative healing and shamanistic practices. So I'm just curious if the careful construction is because you're dealing with the medical world and the need to be taken seriously. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, I called it narrative medicine. I could have called it narrative health or narrative care. But I was in a department of medicine. And uh, it, it happens that the medical end of things, uh, for better or for worse, it shouldn't be, but it is, um, it takes the first step. So, so it was a strategic choice to keep it within medicine um, and, and to bring with me the mainstream power brokers of medicine. That's what it was. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of worked. I mean, NIH just gave me 10 years of funding. It, it kind of worked, mm -hmm. see? So, um, but I'm glad you brought up that, I mean, um, uh, I was just at a meeting in, in Montreal called Whole Person Care mm -hmm. Congress, which is um, what may sound like palliative care in that it has all modalities and all aspects of a person's situation, but that you don't have to wait till you're dying to get. See? So, so no, uh, 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 the yearning that we have for this kind of unified, not fragmented, singular, recognizing, respectful, egalitarian care. Um, is not only today located at the fringes. Mm -hmm. And one doesn't have to choose one over the other. 
this is a great accomplishment. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't do this. The right. culture did this. Right. The culture did this. Well, I think also your book serves in that way because um, a number of us who have a bit of a stance about the uncaringness of doctors felt more compassion for what a, do a doctor's mm. job actually is. Yeah. And like, just your description of the very first death that you saw where you're caring for the patient one day and then the next day you're seeing his organ parts mm. in bowls. I mean, yeah. it's a horrific yeah. experience of life that most doctors are yeah. having. So. Yeah. And and we, mm, I don't know if I have it here. Yes, we we know, but we forget that we are human, and we have bodies, and we will die. You'd think that doctors, nurses, social workers, uh, uh, um, uh, uh, you'd think that we would hold on to that fact. But not only do we not hold on to it, we we. Um, <clears throat> We don't let it in. Mm -hmm. Now, um, this, this is a, a few lines from The Infinities, which is second to last of John Banville's novels. It wasn't a very good novel, I don't think, but it had this dazzling part. Uh, do you read Banville? Are you, are you Banville fans? The Sea. The Sea, The Sea. So, but here, uh, the, the conceit is it's being told by Zeus and his cronies up on Mount Olympus. And they're all looking down at the hapless mortals that they created, right? And this is in the, in the um, voice of Zeus. This is the mortal world. It is a world where nothing is lost, where all is accounted for, while yet the mystery of things is preserved. A world where they may live, however briefly, however tenuously, in the failing evenings of the self solitary and at the same time together somehow here in this place, dying as they may be and yet fixed forever in a luminous, unending instant. Now we all should know that, but we don't. Mm -hmm. So let's open it up to questions on that note. I, I would ask your opinion about what's been going through my mind in a sense that I see a bifurcation in a variety of areas of our society, certainly economically in our city, and I'm reminded of that here as well. There is something, and I mean it in a positive sense, but elitist in when you mentioned Texas or when the young resident says, I'm in my third year and he's looking forward to have to deal with Obamacare and the myriad of upheaval in our hospital systems. So what you're saying is very beautiful and poetic, and I would love to believe um, that I could have doctors that would talk like you. How can we realistically expect this, and what do you see in it? So over the decades, there have been um, there is a myriad, myriad movements called many different things. Uh, uh, Relationship-centered care, patient-centered care, medical home, healer's art, this whole person, uh, uh, integrative care. Uh, uh, compliment, it used to be called complementary medicine. We stopped calling it complementary because that sounded like it was elective. Mm -hmm. So now it's integrative care. There, there are all of these kind of neighboring efforts to make things not fragmented, just, respectful, accurate. And of late, we're all kind of gathering and saying, look, we're in the same federation. And if all of us who belong to this federation came into the clearing, there would be more of us in it than out of it. Now you have to talk about plain old political activism. Someone makes these decisions. We kind of know who do, but we kind of don't. And it has as much to do with the shareholders of Aetna and Prudential as anything else. So that's where we have to start. 
And I'm, I'm not saying, I mean, I, I don't know who's gonna lead this movement. It is, it is not, it is no longer a fragmented figment of somebody's dream. There are more, even within the healthcare providers, e even if you just start there, there are more who would come into this clearing than would stay out of it. Within, within the professions, you probably know this, um, um, there's great, great um, unhappiness. So it's going to need a civil rights movement, a feminist movement, but we can, and I'm not just talking for myself, there, there's any number, I mean it's, it's many, many of these kind of startups, all right? And, and we're finally able to say, okay, now it's time to coalesce all these little startups, even though there are distinctions among them, and I don't do Reiki, but I know people who do. <laughs> do, do you see what I mean? So no, you're not, that's an optimist, that's a wonderful way, and it is, um, it is a positive, hopeful way. And Either that, or we're all doomed. <laughs> <laughs> Which is the plot that we have in question in our class. Is there right? a plot to life? I mean, in effect, we are all doomed. We know that. But in the meantime. But the mortality is both. That's part of the game. So um, that's not, death is not, it's, it's while we're here. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of the injustice or, yeah. and what you, it, yes, it, it comes in little pieces, but it does take a coalescence. I'm going to ask a question for Harmony, or I'm going to interpret a question for Harmony because she can't speak because she's next to the camera. Oh. Um, the, the notion of time, mm. I think, is really interesting in this, both in terms of the narrative of the body and also of um, texts. And I just was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that. You don't mean the time spent? Time spent, but also time in literature, how time changes in the course of a story. Well, I mean, if, if anybody wants to, to see texts with kind of dazzling temporal structures, you know, come on into my Thursday morning clinic. Because it's, it's so, okay, here's an example. Um, you know, the guy, I see him for the first time. I, I, I ask him as I do new patients, tell me what you think I should know about your situation. And he says, 20 years ago, my father died of kidney disease. And 10 years ago, my brother died of kidney disease. And now I'm having real trouble with my 21-year-old son, who's rebellious and, 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 and angry. And then he stops and he starts crying. And I say, why are you crying? He says, no one ever let me do this before. Now you tell me the temporal structure of that. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. And he is on his, just in a spontaneous utterance, bringing together two decades at, at, at two different uh, uh, removes, and then a future with he doesn't know what his son is going to do, but he's uh, uh, uh. Um, and then to say nobody ever let me do this before. Um, it, it's just very, very, and, and you have to see all of those turns in order to, to say kind of, oh, you know. Um, I, I appreciate that I've been in this practice since 1981. So there are people for whom I've been their doctor for 33 years. And it's kind of mind-blowing. Um, some time ago they said, oh, well, we're going we're gonna to shred all your charts. Because, because they need more space. So I had to hire a carting crew to come down into my office and bring all my charts. I mean, there were boxes and boxes. So, so it's not as if there's great respect for the temporal complexity and the temporal density of what we go through with patients. Um, but there is. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious because I know we have three therapists. Are there more? 
this three or former therapist for. Um, does this seem like it crosses a line into what you do? Fran, I could ask you because I can see your face. But in rehab, I mean, the, 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 the temporal events are, are um, just very complex because some of, some of the losses go on very slowly, some of the gains go on very slowly. The, the, the sense of, what have I lost? And, and certainly um, the sense of future. I mean, it's exquisite in, in rehab. I guess especially in terms of what many have lost, right? Yeah. Yes, and and so what we what we do know is that this does not take more time than other ways of running your clinic. Um, if you're good at it you can get rather quickly to at least open a door in the patient's narrative world. You know how to do that. You have to be trained to do that. Uh, but once you do, it's not like it takes a whole lot more time because you can start more quickly. And um, I mean, if, I, if, if I'm now having patients write their own charts, well, that's a time saver for me. I can have, I can have several rooms going at once. I mean, that's kind of cool. But I, I mean, I, I don't mean just that. But, but so, um, so we're doing this study now, we're applying for federal funds to bring narrative training into the ambulatory clinics, into the workplace, where it's not just whoever's interested in this, not who, just who wants to come, but everybody. In the, there's three different kind of uh, clinics at, at Columbia that we've approached. And they're going to give us an hour twice a month for six months, during which we're going to do a lot of these kind of uh, practices in how to read and how to write. And some, more, some of it will have to do with particular patients in their, in their practice, some of it won't. And we're, we're gathering some, some um, uh, consequences. Mm -hmm. I mean, we haven't got the money yet, so I don't know if we can do it, but we will be gathering some of the consequences of this. Are there gonna be differences in how these doctors and nurses write about the patients in the chart? Are there gonna be differences in how they talk and listen? Because we'll be doing some audio taping of, of what goes on in the, in the visits. Might there be differences in even how the patients might answer questions like, do you think your doctor knows what your concerns are, which patients are asked routinely. We mm -hmm. think that they'll be more likely to believe that their doctor or nurse knows what their concerns are. See? Um, so that's, that's a way of saying um, this, is, this is not only going to be a boutique thing that people at Columbia do, but what the next step once we can show that people are going to come to this training is that the patients who they take care of will have better glucose in their diabetes, will be able to lose weight more effectively than others, maybe actual clinical health outcomes that we think it's not crazy to expect will be better because there has been a meeting and there is more trust, there is more trustworthiness, there is more willingness to, at very least, come back for the next visit. Mm -hmm. See? Yeah. Did you have a question? Oh, well, I was just wondering, the, the patient that you said, um, tell me what I need to know about your illness. No, tell me what you think I should know about your situation.
Yes, and I think the most important part is the silence that follows that sentence. And you can use, I happen to like my sentence, I think it says exactly what I want to say, um, but it's the silence that follows it. And it's, it's silence with hands in lap, not writing, not typing, just listening. Just listening. Oh, we had some writers over here. We'll come back to you, Fred. Jackie. So the next step be getting the patients themselves to write their story and interact with the physician. Well, there's 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 a way for patients it just just started at Columbia to open their own medical chart and write in it. So yeah. So so that's what I'm gonna try to use where and it, it, whatever they write, even if it's from remotely, will be seen by anybody who opens that chart. So at the beginning, it was, it was thought to be something like, you know, no, I'm not taking 100 milligrams of labetalol <laughs> twice a day. It's 300 milligrams once a day, that kind of thing. But who's to say they can't do other things too? So we're going to use this, this portal um, and let, let each patient add to. Now, it's been for, for a while. Sorry. Um, patients bring me things that they've written. I've had, you know, poems written in jail, letters to dead people, I mean, that kind of thing. Um, when, when one woman was, was incredibly incensed by the uh, treatment she got when she went for her bone density scan, she wrote this gorgeous black comic thing about her bone density scan. I mean, she really nailed it. Now, she didn't do anything with it. I mean, I, I read it. She, she felt much better. <laughs> and I knew what she had been through. So I, I think there's no end. We have two more questions over here. What are the inherent limitations to Eric Medicine? What she said. <laughs> The corporatization, the commodification, the uh, um, what what stands as legal tender in healthcare, which is not the care, but the dollars. So that's that's what the race is. It's whether the profit and the greed of my colleagues, as well as the industry, whether the profit and the greed will outstrip or beat um, the concern for health. Did you have a question, Patrick? Mm -hmm. um, what are the opportunities, or are there opportunities for um, writers without medical training to get involved with your type of work? Well, yeah, that's why we started a graduate school because we needed people <laughs> to, to, I mean, I mean, we had no idea who would come when we, when we offered a master's degree. Um, and it's been about a half health professionals and a half not. And the not are writers and uh, teachers of writing who want to know how to do this in hospital. Um, now, it, it's not like a wholesale, there's no, there's no, page in the New York Times for job listings, for narrativists in medicine. Um, but as these practices take on visibility and become, um, I mean, it's just very desirable, mm -hmm. um, we need people who know how to do it. Um, I mean, at Columbia for years, we've been relying on our MFA program, and they come on in and they, they tease us. Nellie Herman, who's now creative director, started with us many years ago when she was in the MFA fiction, working with Mary Gordon. And um, she, had, she had an assignment, or, or not an assignment, a requirement mm -hmm. that all MFA students had to do some teaching. So a bunch of them were sent up to us. And she was just great, so we kept her. So they so, were sent up to work in the medical school? Yeah. Which is, which yeah, is, that's yeah, great. yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Chris, uh, one more thing. Um, in, uh, as part of the requirements for the medical students, this is not true in the nursing school and dental school and public health, but in the medical school, there's a requirement that each student uh, participate and enroll in and take and pass a narrative medicine seminar, which is a graduate level small group seminar, either in, in, um, um, in, in writing or in literature or in visual arts. So that we, last year we, we hired uh, uh, Chris Adrian, who taught a fiction writing workshop. I mean, this is very cool. And we had Rachel Haddis teach a poetry workshop. And we had Libby Rosenthal teach a science writing workshop. So, you know, we're doing it. And now people from NYU and other places are saying, well, how do you do that? And where do you find them? Mm -hmm. So I think it's a growth. I really do. Um, the medical schools are as strapped as everybody else for resources and money, so it's not like, I mean, when you start, you got to be good at writing grants. Mm -hmm. Fran, you had a question. Yeah, um, to add to the, and, uh, the depth and anxiety of the doctors and patients who do um, and the funding them, there, there's the, the conflict of interest that doctors have between being the clinicians, educators, and researchers. And, and I wondered, how do you get oncologists to write about what they feel? Oh, they, they, they hear. Do you mean, an, do you mean legally? No, just... Well, they, they, they do in droves. I mean, we've had both uh, um, adult oncology and child on and pediatric oncology uh, doing this work with us from the beginning. Um, the, the, the stories just spill over. And in their case, you know, um, it's not as simple as I thought it was at the beginning, like writing about your illness is good for you. Well, sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. There's a re-traumatization a lot of the time. For the writer, there's certainly a traumatization for the listener or the reader, so that the the risk is evident. Um, but when when I've worked with youngish people in oncology, um, they're uh, really really pressured. They're really pressured to it's it's almost a spilling. Um, and it's, it's quite beyond what you'd want to have a kind of once a month writing seminar for. Just I mean, to, because um, I don't think, Fran, in the book she describes, they have a, it's called um, Oncology, Narrative Oncology. Yeah. And it's a regular group that meets and talks about the, and I think there's a very specific parameter around that group that is, it's not about just venting your feelings, right. but really a, Right, and, and that's, that's, that's the why the writing is so important. Yeah. By now, that group has uh, um, grown to include patients as well. So it's a group that meets once a month, um, patients, family caregivers, nurses, doctors in oncology. And I think sometimes the chaplain comes. So it's, it's one of the rare times that the doctors can hear what patients describe themselves as going through, and that the patients and caregivers can hear the, the engagement and the investment of the doctors and nurses in how they're doing. Do you see? Um, the, the other group who does a lot of writing with us is the palliative care doctors. Judith? Yeah, I'm strangely blessed because I have been in a writing program and I'm a, I'm a, I'm a cancer patient. I uh, still yeah, have no idea. <laughs> but so I am definitely blessed. So unfortunately, I start to talk and then I forget to what I was going to say. But I, I am thoroughly and uh, mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I just want to know where. But, I mean, blessed is such a marvelous, powerful word. So you're blessed to be here. You're blessed to be writing. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, probably the blessing of having all the people who make everything blessed for me because then out of that, mm. um, I, I'd rather not have yeah. it. Yeah. But out of that, I have some comedy writing that is 
You know, I mean, where do we learn to behold? So, I gradually came to understand that what, what I, how can I say, what I do when I'm at the Met in front of one of Cezanne's Baie de Marseille, or what I do when, like last night, I'm at Cornelia Street Cafe, listening to Chris Davis playing the piano. What I do there is not unlike what I do in the office when I'm at my best. That I am summoned out of myself by the solemnity or the gravity or the beauty, the singularity of this work. So that, and, and I, I mean, I, I'm not, this is, this is true, that I feel summoned out of myself to be with this woman who's telling me about her grandson, or, um, or with the woman who ended up writing her, her own chart, chart entry. So, so there's a kinship between these ways in which we use our human beings to see or hear or take in um, works, works of art. So, so that more and more in my mind, the care of the sick is a work of art. That it requires that kind of aesthetic <laughs> engagement. So, does that make sense to you? Do, do you know what I'm struggling to say? But you're wondering about the practical application, like do you well, bring art into patients? Like, I guess now I'm thinking, do people respond better to different? Uh, well, like if you're in the Met, I mean, how do you um, do therapy? Do you just uh, do these sorts of exercises um, through art with them when they're in a hospital, or how do you do it through music, and, or is that not what you do? Um, I'll give you a, an example from music, if that's, if that's okay. So, so I recently became a jazz producer. I didn't mean to, but I did. Because um, I know Fred Hirsch, who's a jazz pianist and a composer, and uh, himself was very sick, almost died of his AIDS, and was in the hospital for months in a coma for six weeks. Mm -hmm. And when he emerged from his coma, I mean, he actually got better. He, he got better, and he got extubated, and they took the feeding tube out, and he was able, after months, to sit up, and then to talk, and then to walk, and then to go home, and then to play the piano. And w once he was better, he composed a work that he called My Coma Dreams, which was based on the dreams he had during the six weeks of coma. And he worked with a writer, and um, together they made not just a concert, but a theater, a jazz theater, with dialogue and an actor and sets and, um, and gorgeous music that, that he composed. So um, I understood that, I understood that there were things that he knew about serious illness and near death that because he's a composer, he could tell me that they were aspects that bypassed language and maybe couldn't be contained in language, but came from the composer's creative action straight into <laughs> that part of my brain that understands the music. Do you see? 
so that we so we put on we, we produced uh, a performance a couple of of this my coma dreams at the Columbia uh, uh, Miller Theater, and there were there were doctors in the audience like middle aged old doctors who came out weeping saying Rita I've had so many kids in the ICU I've seen so many of them die but I didn't know what they went through. So, so it was the bypassing of the language that interested me, that it went from his composing mind into a means by which my mind, or whatever it is, could absorb what it was. You know, yes, we, we do have uh, students go to the museum, they go to the Frick and the Met and MoMA, so as to learn how to see, mm -hmm. that's what it's for. And, and, you know, they'll have a two-hour class, but 45 minutes of it is spent in front of one work. And they're told, just look at it. And then maybe even talk to others who have been looking at it. So it's very much a training in perceiving. It's a training in perceiving. Yeah, what the last one? Huh. Have you started using a tape recorder in your practice, or do you still record that and simply listen and then write after the patient getting dressed? If that yeah, because I, I'm glad you asked that. There are some cases I told you in this research project we're going to be audio taping the the interviews, mostly to see if things change from the beginning to the end of the of the training. But the other one, um, you know, if it's a version or construal, I think that's kind of what we're both after. It's not like just the facts, ma'am. And did I or didn't I tell her to take the Kozar in the morning and not in the afternoon? I mean, it's not for that. It's how does this whole thing cohere in the writing? I mean, I know enough about myself as a writer that it's as it goes that the meaning and the shape come to be. Not even come to me, but come to be. So that's what I'm after. It's not so much a, a recitation of you said, then I said, then you said, then I said. Because then you'd still have to interpret that. Or not, uh, interpret's the wrong word. You'd still have to uh, confer form on that. And it's in the conferring of form that I think we're exposing the meaning. That's a good place to end. Huh? Fantastic. We're going to thank Rita Chair for coming.